So uh, without further ado, I'd like to present our speaker tonight, David Santo. David is a researcher, teacher, and artist artist, uh, taking an experimental approach to food studies through performance, ecology, and design. He has taught at several universities in Canada and abroad, and is an associate editor of the open access journal, Canadian Food Studies. He's currently co-editing the textbook, Food Studies, Matter, Meaning, and Movement. So, hi, David, welcome. Hello, thank you very much. Thank you, um, Daniel, very much for that nice introduction. And also, uh, thank you to the Westmont Library for doing these events and for um, hosting me virtually, as it were. We, Daniel and I were talking um, just before all of you joined this room. And we actually got in touch about two years ago. So it's actually really nice to be sitting in front of you as it were. So tonight, I am talking about some of the experience that I had in Timor-Leste, which uh, some of us who are alive in the 70s would know better possibly as East Timor, a country that has gone through an enormous amount of struggle and strife and also incredibly rich in food culture and other culture, uh, fascinating place full of language and diversity and just uh, most some of the most wonderful people I've ever met. Before I get started though, I do want to just acknowledge that uh, like you, some of you, um, we are currently on unceded indigenous lands. Uh, the Nankyahaga Nation is also known sometimes as Mohawk Nation, is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters around me personally, and as we're gathering here virtually, um, we're thinking about all of the people, um, their lands, both ceded and treaty recognized, uh, with which we, all humans, are entangled. And I'm very grateful to be here for that reason and others. And I'm particularly grateful, I think gratitude is an important word in many food-related contexts, and particularly as a, as a food scholar who goes around the world and travels and meets people and learns about places, and then comes back to his home and tells about them. I think it's very important also to acknowledge that um, I am deeply grateful to have had those experiences, but I also never want to try to pretend that they were mine alone, or that what I'm about to tell you is the absolute truth. I'm representing my experience as best as I can, but uh, in a similar way that we need to acknowledge the lands that we're on, we should also acknowledge the, the kind of knowledges that we carry with us, that we present, and that sometimes we call our own knowledge and sometimes we call other people's knowledge, uh, but that really it's a shared experience, a shared knowledge. And that is particularly true when it comes to food. Um, before I get started, uh, some of you know me, some of you don't. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a sense of who I am, because again, who I am also influences the way that I think about food, the way I talk about food, um, and my perspectives on what I witnessed and what I believe to be true, but may or may not be true. And then as I'm asking, as I'm telling you about myself, I might ask you the same question, who are you? Why are you here in this Zoom room? And what is your interest in food, food culture, uh, Timor Leste, uh, going to a public lecture at the, the, the Westmont Library. Um, so, you know, maybe why are you here too? And how are you going to filter what I tell you? Uh, so, just briefly about me, I wear a number of different uh, outfits, um, including university type person who le gives lectures and talks. Uh, I'm very interested in digital media as well and uh, get involved sometimes in research projects that involve food and media and technology. Uh, I am uh, sometimes artist and performer and use performance and art as a way to understand my subject better. Um, and then this picture in the lower right hand corner is a bit of a tongue in cheek acknowledgement that I have also been known to uh, sleep with some of the large uh, food companies in the world and smaller ones because I also do some consulting work uh, around food. And those different, different perspectives, different experiences tend to then inflect the way I think about the work that I do. And that work is about food systems uh, in a very broad sense. Uh, food systems are uh, the plural systems of the world, all the ways that we gather and grow food and uh, produce it and transform it and then transport it and send it to other people in different places around the world and prepare and cook it. All that is what makes up our food systems. And to me, these are some of the most, uh, what I call lively, complex and intersubjective systems in the world. And by that, I just mean that they're very difficult 
to study in a conventional sense. They are dynamic, they change, they move, people move around the planet, food moves, food itself transforms, it rots, it grows, it digests, it does all these things. And so to study it as an academic is a very weird thing because generally our, our subjects sit still and food doesn't sit still. And not only is it all this lively complexity that makes food complicated, but it also goes into us. And this is what's one of the most interesting things, I think, for many people who work with food um, in academic senses or in, in cultural or artistic senses, is that we actually ingest the subject that we are ostensibly studying. So like, how would it be if we you know, ate everything that we ever studied? Well, maybe some of us would not feel so well about that, if, depending on the subjects that we study. But the, um, the intersubjectivity of food is very important because even as we're trying to nail it down and understand it, it's changing us and, and we're changing it. So I think that's one of the things that I try to stay true to when I'm doing my work. And maybe that'll come up again later on in this talk. So if you want to call things a system, then maybe we actually, when we're talking about food, we really need to think about systems of systems. And so that gets into this area of complexity, which is what some people call chaos. And chaos and complexity are all fascinating to study, but it does make getting a single truth difficult. And that's why I say that what I'm talking about tonight is, is really my perspective on things um, and what I experience rather than any kind of absolute truth or knowledge that I might be bringing back from a place that I once visited. The way I try to deal with this is with what I call uh, a method or a framework uh, for my research that's called eco-gastronomy. And this is about thinking about food systems in the sort of ecological sense, and not just in terms of the ecological, the environment as an ecology, but all of the ecologies, the human ecologies, the ecologies of taste, the ecologies of language, the ecologies of technology. So eco-gastronomy tries to get to that idea of, of things being lively, complex, and intersubjective, but we still want to try to understand them. We still want to try to do something. And it's not just about studying food systems, because obviously that's one of the things I do, but it's also about all of us participating in food systems. So maybe eco-gastronomy is also a way for us to engage in our own worlds of food, whether you're a scholar or not, whether you're an artist or not. It's just a way to think about, oh yeah, what I do here and now has an effect later on and for other people. Anyway, this is a lot of blah, 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 but um, just as a, as a sort of framework to help you understand why I, I will be talking about Timor in the way that I will. Um, so eco gastronomy, you might say it's, it's political, it's economic, it's environmental, it is definitely sensorial, but also the social and the technological. All of these things are part of the way that I approach food. So it's about doing stuff with food and thinking about it and reflecting about on it and talking with other people and engaging in food itself rather than coming at it from a distance perspective. So with that as a kind of preamble, what I'm about to tell you is a story of eco-gastronomy in Timor-Leste. And it's also in some ways a story about storytelling itself. And I hope that will become clear at the end. But if it isn't, tell me it wasn't clear and then I'll try to explain it again. So this story actually starts somewhere in 2015 when I was working for a university in Italy called the University of Gastronomic Sciences. And I organized this project that eventually took me to 14 different countries around the world between 2015 and 2017. Thinking about all that travel now seems almost unfathomable. But the Ego Gastronomy Project was really an effort to try to share some of this perspective on Ego Gastronomy with other places in the world and at the same time gather and, and exchange ideas about local food systems and local food and local knowledge and to just be in that, to engage in this way. So the first stop that I made on the Ego Gastronomy Project was in Korea, in Seoul specifically. And this is a photograph of the, um, of the Royal Banquet that many of us who were at this conference and event participated in. And it was an incredible meal. And I won't go into it because I'm not talking about the food of Korea tonight, I'm talking about the food of Timor Leste. But if you will direct your gaze to the lower right hand corner of this image, there's a woman sitting there in profile 
And she is kind of the reason, in fact, she is absolutely the reason that I ended up going to Timor-Leste for the first time. And her name is Alva Lin. Alva will show up in the story again later. In fact, throughout. But one of the things that happened during that dinner was that I gave Alva a copy of my then business card. And this is an image of that business card. And for the Eco Gastronomy Project, my colleagues and I at the university decided that we would call me professor at large. I'd been a professor there for a long time. I'd been a, a program director. I'd been doing a lot of teaching and a lot of research. And in this case, I was going to be traveling around the world. So we thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting if we had a professor at large? And I thought it's also like the silliest title that anybody might have ever had. So I had these cards printed up and I thought maybe they'll raise an eyebrow once in a while. And nobody laughed until I sat across the table at a royal banquet in Seoul, Korea. And I was there with Alva Lin and she looked at my business card and she started laughing and laughing and laughing. Professor at large, what does that even mean? Are you the large professor? And to this day, I am sometimes called by her and her husband, large professor. Um, and indeed, as I went on the eco gastronomy tour, I did a lot of eating and I got a bit larger. But um, what suddenly happened at that moment was, oh, here is a, for me, a, a kindred spirit. Here's someone who gets it. Here's someone who laughs at the right places. And so that was my first little connection with Alva. So this conference wraps up and we're sitting in the hotel lobby and there's Alva with a most extraordinary box of chocolates in her hands that she had come to uh, Seoul with from Dili. Dili is the capital of, of Timor-Leste. And uh, she was offering the chocolates around and I had a chocolate and we, we chatted again. And I said, she said, what are you doing next? And I said, well, I'm going to Singapore da, 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 in February. And she said, oh, Singapore, that's not so far from, from Timor. I said, come to Dili. And I said, great, I will. Not having any clue where Dili or Timor-Leste was. So that was a bit of a surprise when I started thinking about what it would actually mean to go to Timor-Leste. Here is a, a map. Uh, uh, that sort of places at the center, Timor-Leste. It's, it's um, an independent nation at the eastern tip of that archipelago that includes uh, Malaysia and Sumatra and uh, Indonesia and Bali. And then at the eastern tip or towards the east of that is Timor-Leste. And it turns out that there are flights quite easy from Singapore to Timor-Leste, but they only go every couple of days and uh, they do cost a fair chunk of change and it's three hours not just a quick hop skip and a jump so I thought oh well I think I need to go and that was my first trip to Timor-Leste in 2016. There's a little bit of a closer view and you can see just north of that red uh, marker is it's a little island with a yellow marker on it and that island will come back into the story again later. So I got to Timor-Leste in February of 2016 and met up again with Alva and we did many fascinating uh, explorations of the food culture in Timor and there she and I sat and had a coconut. She actually tricked me because she said, there's a saying that if you drink a coconut in Timor, you will always come back again in the future. So this was her way of making sure that I was not just a one-time visitor um, and indeed it worked. So one of the things that Alva showed me was the Tairesi market in Dili. And this is an extraordinary place. It's huge. It's, uh, for those of us who are in Montreal, we may be familiar with the Jean Talon market. The Tairesi market is bigger. It extends in multiple directions and there are all sorts of products. And I was blown away, not only by the diversity of food, but the diversity of individual species. There were three different kinds of passion fruit and four different kinds of banana. And I just kept looking and being amazed at this diversity. And this was indeed one of the things that, that Alva wanted me to understand is that the Timor-Leste is a place of incredible agrobiodiversity. And this is for a number of reasons, which I'll get into shortly. So after being at the market, we also then organized our first storytelling night in Timor. And this was an idea to get people just to share their own stories of food. It wasn't about me talking about food, it was about them talking about the things that they found interesting. And this was partly important to Alva because she was then working for Slow Food Dili, which is part of the International Slow Food Network. 
um, where groups, local groups, try to make sure that people living in that region are aware of the incredible foods that are around them, the local foods, the foods that aren't being imported from other countries, but that have some connection to the place. And so we organized this evening and uh, people came and we had all these wonderful food products from the Tedesi market. And Alva had also created, which is not a great photo in front of you, but had also created this extraordinary map with a number of colleagues, a map of Timor, Timor-Leste, I will alternate sometimes between Timor-Leste and Timor, but Timor-Leste is the full name of the country. Um, and this map was made of the foods that grow in specific regions of Timor. And you can see the incredible diversity just visually on that map, that there are these beans that grow here, and tomatoes that grow there, and coffee that grows here, and spices that grows there. And this map really shows how Timor's diversity is spread out across the island. It's not all concentrated in large, extensive agricultural plots like in a lot of North America. It's actually an incredibly uh, mosaic-like place of food production. And there are many, many different things that are produced. One of the other uh, pieces of this uh, evening, the storytelling evening, that really struck me was the idea that was, again, a terrible picture, but hero food. And hero food is a very complex idea in Timor. Because Timor-Leste, as many of you may know, has gone through an extraordinary amount of political upheaval and strife and invasion and occupation and civil war. And throughout that time, there were people who were fighting for the independence of Timor. And many of them had to live in the mountains, away from the larger cities, away from easy access to food. And hero food was the kind of food that they would eat when they had very little of uh, very little to eat, or very, very a food that could be eaten uh, without too much cooking. Because, of course, if you start a fire, the people who are looking for you might see the smoke and come after you. So, hero food is a very complicated subject. Um, it's about the history of Timor. Some of it is, is, is delicious, some of it is much less delicious because obviously, when you are eating things uh, that you have access to, you're not always eating the most delicious things. Um, but there's a pride in that. There's a part of that's very embedded in the Timorese history. Um, and it's also a point of contention for some people because, of course, when civil wars occur, not everybody is in favor of the outcome. So we did tell stories that night. And I told a story, and a wonderful, generous woman helped translate it into Tetan, which is one of the two uh, local languages, in uh, the other one being Portuguese in Timor. And as we were talking, I was realizing I was having a hard time telling my story because what I really wanted to do was hear everybody else's stories. And so eventually I just, I just shut up and let all the other great people talk. Um, and these are some of the great people who were also there. This is, this is on my last day on that first trip in Timor. Uh, Mark Notaros on the left, who is Alva's husband, and Gobi Rajalingnam, who is on the right, who's a great friend with whom I stayed. And this beautiful picture stays with me always because it is this, there's this moment, I was only there for three days, but I was completely transformed by my experience with these three wonderful people and all the people who participated in the storytelling. And because I ate that coconut and drank the coconut liquid, I knew I would be coming back. And so really, this is just the introduction to the story I have not yet to tell. Time passes, in fact, a number of years pass, and we stay in touch and we talk about different things. In the meantime, Alva and Mark start up the Agora Food Studio, which is a social entrepreneurship in Dili, where they both cook and serve food and um, also help young people learn more about taste, learn more about local uh, Timorese food, and also learn about communicating to others about Timorese food. And so the Agora Food Studio was going strong. And then Mark, this guy, sent me an email and said, hey, large professor, got an idea. Wondering if you might be interested. What's the idea, I said to Mark. He said, well, we're starting this project. It's called the Timor Leste Food Innovators Exchange. And we're gonna kind of base it out of the Agora Food Studio, but..." We want to do something that hasn't been done here before. We want to really expand what we've done within the cafe restaurant and help a larger 
audience get to know what about the incredible food and the incredible history of food in Timor? And I said, oh, that sounds interesting. Well, how can I help? And he said, well, I'm not sure. Let's talk about it. So we did talk about it. And eventually uh, he shared some documents with me, some uh, questions and some comments and some ideas. And I gave some suggestions back, but what they were really trying to face and explore were some of these major challenges that Timor is facing. Uh, things like malnutrition, undernutrition, of course, which is a problem in many developing countries, in many places that are uh, industrializing, in many places uh, that have gone through strife and, and war times. And one of the challenges was that people don't have enough to eat, even though there is a great deal of variety um, and interesting food in Timor. As a nation, it was not able to satisfy the needs of all of its humans. And that's also, also facing that other problem of countries that are uh, industrializing is uh, a great deal of consumption of industrialized food, which can also lead to overnutrition or malnutrition of a kind of uh, bad, well, not bad, I don't want to say bad calories, but calories that don't do a great deal of uh, support for the body. Other challenges were the economic and political instability that Timor has been going through for many, many years um, and now is coming out of, but because of its history, it still faces to a certain extent. There's a kind of recolonization process that's going on as well as countries like the United States and China are bringing, seeing Timor as a great new market for some of their industrial food products and other things. Um, Timor has its own history of colonization by the Portuguese, but then uh, in more recent years, the sort of transnational companies are doing a lot of stuff. There. And there is inherently to all places that have gone through civil strife, a degree of socio-cultural erosion that's going on and questioning of who we are, who they are as a people, uh, partly because of all of this chaos that's been going on for hundreds of years. At the same time, there's an enormous number of opportunities. Timor's got a great cultural history, many different influences, many different food ways, many different ideas and and cultures that come together. As I said, there's this incredible agro-diversity, uh, but also cultural diversity. There are homestay associations, which are homestays are a sort of like bed and breakfasts um, where uh, people will have access to a, basically somewhere to, to, to sleep and some food. And the homestays are uh, fairly, fairly simple and very welcoming. And um, the island of Abduaro, which is where I showed you on that map, uh, we went. Uh, which I will show you again, uh, also has a number of associations, but it's a very interesting, flexible kind of, let's say, culinary tourism opportunity. Then there are also a lot of different nation building efforts on a lot of different fronts, some of them international development organizations, and some of them uh, cultural and musical and food oriented and many other things. And then because Timor is Timor, lots of people do lots of different things. So uh, you have celebrities who are also food activists, who are also educators, who are also ministerial consultants. And um, that means that a lot of different things can happen quite quickly because a lot of people are very closely connected. And then the objectives of the project are basically to bring a, an additional degree of health and wellness to help contribute to this nation building effort to gather data about the plants uh, that grow both wild and are, that are also uh, cultivated, but also to instill a sense of pride and power in the participants in the project, and then maybe to do some culinary innovation and create some new food products, which we'll see we did. Do not look at this slide. I just wanted to tell you that this is an international development project, and so Mark is probably laughing right now wherever he is. Uh, this slide is just to say, the project started from an international development perspective. I came on as a kind of academic consultant. The homestay operators were a kind of client to us as the project team. And then we had all of these other different people, storytellers and facilitators and sociologists and, and ministerial, uh, ministerial contacts who were helping us with policy. So a lot of people came together through, and this, this grid is one way that I try to represent that. But really it was about these people. It was about wonderful people who loved Timor, who wanted to do something great and help, uh, help everybody around them learn more about Timor's food and the pleasure that can come from it, and the pride, and the security, and those filled stomachs, all of those things together. So 
Coming back to TMARC, let's look at this. This is a place that is just south of the equator. It's between um, the behemoth that is Australia and the many, many, many countries of Southeast Asia. It's a really unusual, interesting place. It has a very complicated history of migration, um, starting, presumably, some scholars believe as many as 40,000 and well, 42,000 years ago, there were uh, what we call the Vedo Australians. It's, a, it's a, a population that migrated through Melanesians, the Proto Malays. And this, is, this means that there was a lot of movement, a lot of migration in and out of the country. And so a lot of influences, cultural and historical and linguistic, that then start implanting themselves in Timor. In the 18th century, the Portuguese start colonizing. And use Timor largely as an agricultural uh, resource to be exploited for its coffee, its chocolate, its spices. World War II, the Americans and the Japanese occupied Timor at different times. In 1975, was the Indo Indonesian invasion marking um, the beginning of an incredible amount of violence and, and hurt, and including the very marking moment in 1991 where a terrible massacre took place in Dili but that may have also in some ways helped to trigger what is now what became a peacemaking effort in the, by the UN in, in, in the end of the 20th, uh, 21st century, uh, 20th century, sorry. And then finally in 2002, the Democratic Republic of Timor-Leste was created as, an, as its own independent sovereign nation. But throughout that history, a lot of violence, a lot of sadness. Meanwhile, back in D, back in 2015, back in our contemporary times, just to give you a sense of some of the foods that, are, uh, that were historically exported and still are being produced and exported, some amazingly good turmeric that I continue to consume in tiny little quantities because I don't have much left. Um, but very interestingly, you start to also see some of those cultural food influences when you go to a place like the Tedeschi Market where you see um, here figured in front, corn, maize, and beans of various sorts. But corn is a very important staple starch in many cultures, but it's mostly attributable to the, the early Portuguese influence. Historically before that, sorghum, millet, other starchy foods were a kind of base element for most meals, then it, they get gradually where they were replaced by corn due to that colonial influence. The Indonesians also then uh, had an influence of rice, white rice particularly, became very important in Timor as a, as a, as a basic grain. And uh, then more recently, some of the more international, transnational food products uh, start making their way, way in. And, and right now there's a great deal of wheat that is consumed in the form of cup noodles, instant ramen. And cup noodles or instant ramen and, and highly processed uh, wheat flour in the form of baked goods are, are two of the things that are problematic because they're sort of empty calories. Uh, cup noodles themselves have great, a lot of palm oil in them, not great for human bodies or the planet. Um, and MSG also, despite the fact that, that Timor produces some really delicious salt, MSG is also very popular. So there are these very international food products now that have come in and are, are occupying the hearts and minds and stomachs of a lot of people in Timor, um, and in some ways pushing out some of the historic foods because they're so tasty and international and, uh, and easily accessible. We will come back to Sukumin as well. So by the time I get there in July, end of July, 2018, um, the project is already well underway. And Mark and Alva and their team have been doing a great deal of research and a great deal of outreach, including uh, on this island it's called Atauro, uh, which is uh, just north, it's about 35 kilometers north of Dili. So it's part of the municipality of Dili, but it is also its own very, very independent place in some ways. And there are six villages on Atauro, each of them is very different, about 6,000 people, two religions, Protestantism and Catholicism. And some of the photos, I just wanted to acknowledge also Crystal Chu, who was with us on this project, uh, took a lot of beautiful photographs. And um, this one I think I actually took, which is why it's not so beautiful. But many of the photographs that you'll see in this presentation are Crystal's. And so I would like to thank her very much as well. 
So we land on Aturo and we get to our first stop at the Beloy Village Market. And this is the image that you will have seen at the announcement for the, this uh, talk, uh, one of uh, similar images. Uh, and this was this fascinating place. And I keep, well, keep saying fascinating. There's some words, sometimes words just don't describe it. There were so many different things for sale here, palm wine and chilies and pepper, different kinds of pepper and this wonderful man in front who had also made some very beautiful handmade knives. Um, and so there's this, there was just a village market, but there was tons of stuff and tons of people and we were hanging out and they were hanging out. And it was my first introduction to um, the, the sort of real uh, local market of Aturo. Um, there are a number of markets there, but this is the, the two, I believe. But this is, this is the one that we first talked at. And we were trying to understand, well, what's still being grown, caught, dried, salted, eaten, uh, and sold here in Anaturo. And this was our just deep dive into it. So I we get off the boat, we get here. In fact, we had a snack first, but very well, a huge meal. Um, and then we started looking at these extraordinary different things that are for sale, um, including this stuff, which I'll come back to called Nutain. And Nutain is, uh, we, uh, some of us called it uh, like uh, coconut brownie. It, it is basically lightly caramelized shredded coconut. It's a byproduct of making coconut oil because when the coconut meat is boiled to release the oil, you end up with this stuff that, that gets uh, sort of the residue at the bottom of the pot. But it's also absolutely delicious and super nutritious and full of fiber. And it was one of the things that was being sold for pennies a bag at the Illinois market. These objects, which the man had also created, are for scraping the inside of coconuts to take that coconut meat out in shreds so that we can then put it into the pot and boil it down and make it tame. Uh, but there are these wonderful handmade tools and I tried not to just buy everything because of course I don't boil down coconut meat very often in my home kitchen here in Montreal, um, but I was very sorely tempted to because these devices were so fascinating to look at and touchable. The market, had uh, all sorts of people doing all sorts of things, including these two people who were hanging fish that had been freshly caught and gutted and was being dried in the sun. We also got to eat some of the most extraordinary, delicious fish that I've ever had. And some, I believe that was octopus and these um, katupa sacks full of uh, wonderful steamed rice, very simple meal that I was, uh, just blown away by here's me putting some um, bilimbi pickle, where bilimbi is a sort of star fruit, a very small star fruit that makes just about the most delicious thing I've ever made in my life. We were all addicted to it by the end of the trip, um, but it's, uh, we, we ate it in great quantities. And it's a very kind of sour, bright, pickled, almost like a chutney, except doesn't quite, chutney doesn't quite describe it. We put it on everything. We put it on our breakfast, we put it on our lunch, we put it on our hands. It was pretty good. And of course, the coconuts, coconuts everywhere. And so we, we I tried to drink a few coconuts on Aturo just in case it would help me get back there in the future. We'll see. So at this market, we also found one of the things that I am still struck by very powerfully, and I, I jokingly call it value subtracted kumbili. Um, and kumbili is this thing, this, these large blackish brown objects uh, sitting on the shelf in front of the woman that we're looking at. There's another image of them. And, and kumbili is roughly translates as giant lesser yam. It's a big tuber, uh, starchy on the inside. Um, very sort of fluffy and light, kind of like a potato mixed with bread uh, or like a light fluffy bread. And, and, and it's really amazing and, and, and weird and a little bit sweet and a little bit savory and very good for sharing. But the extraordinary thing about kumbi is that it is very large, sometimes as big as two feet long when they are harvested. Uh, they're actually a foraged tuber that people dig up in the hills but because they're so large, they're also very heavy. And so what can you do to reduce the weight of a kumbili? Well, you can pit roast it. You have to roast it anyway to eat it. But if you pit roast it on site in the hills, 
that will reduce the weight because a lot of the water is extracted through the roasting process. So it's actually lighter to carry it down to the market and therefore less labor. And therefore you can sell it at a more reasonable price. So by doing extra work and subtracting the water from the kumbili, it actually turns it into a product that is more sellable and therefore more profitable. So this idea that you would do extra work to a food product rather than sell it in the raw, huh, that started turning my head and making me think, this is a place that I don't really understand. And it was an important first step for me in trying to get, <clears throat> trying to let go of my existing frameworks of knowledge, my existing biases and understandings, and start to try, just try to see things in a more Timorese kind of way. One of the other things that we did during this trip was to invite a number of different people with, with connections to food to come and tell us their stories. And this is where this becomes a story about storytelling. And I influenced this process to a certain extent because I think of storytelling as an important way to create the future that you want to see. And so I suggested this as, a, as, a, as an exercise and still recalling my first experience with, with Alva in the first storytelling workshop in Dili. And we organized this, the storytelling event. And in Tetan, the language of, of Timon, storytelling translates roughly as conte historia. So we were asking people to do conte historia for us so that we could hear and learn more about their food ways. We did this at a place called Menukoko Rick, which is one of these homestay guest houses on Aturu, a fairly beautiful place with lots of open air spaces. And this is in fact where we held our storytelling workshop. And we sat and we listened and they had brought food and they had brought different ingredients, different ways that they process so stories of the different ways that they process these foods. And everything took place in Tetan, and in fact, the local dialect of Tetan as well. And so I sat watching more than listening, because of course I didn't understand. But my colleagues who do speak Tetan, including Safira, who is their center of the image, who was our storytelling facilitator, and Alva and Mark, and everybody who understood some Tetan would take notes. And so we had lots of these interesting, intriguing insights into foods that were pre colonization, foods that were pre transnational invasion. And the more we listened, the more we realized how extraordinarily rich, <clears throat> how many opportunities there were for doing things or just remembering that these foods were delicious and available and accessible. But one of the strangenesses of this experience was that Conte Historia didn't quite translate didn't, the storytelling didn't quite translate into Conte Historia as I thought of it. Storytelling, I think of as a creative, pleasurable process. Conte Historia is more about getting historical facts correct. And so Conte Historia is sometimes <clears throat> a responsibility to remember a family's history, to remember um, an economic debt, to remember different facts from the past that need to be recorded. And so you're sort of a knowledge keeper as it was someone who does Conte Historia. But a lot of the stories from Timor's past are very painful, are very violent, and often families were being ripped apart. And so to remember all those stories was actually a painful process. And so eventually we started thinking that maybe weaving is a better notion. And this is just, this is a fishing basket that we discovered on the side of the road as we went for a walk and work. But it was such a beautiful image I'll to share it because it seems like food is everywhere in Timor. And even by the side of the road, there's this fishing basket and it's, it's part, of the, part of the scenery, but it's part of the world. It's part of everyday life. Food is deeply interwoven with Timor culture. And weaving is also a, a, an important practice, textile weaving in Timor, uh, to create ties, which are these kind of documents, records of a family history, but also beautiful fabric and garments that are used ceremonially and decoratively. And <clears throat> so the idea of weaving maybe started becoming a way of thinking about how can you create a future that is more happy, necessary, more forward-looking, more positive than Conte Story, which might be about 
too much based in the sad past. Then we get into some of these amazing foods. And moringa or marungi as it's called in Timor is now around the world known as a superfood. It's one of these things that people think will cure everything that ails you. <clears throat> but moringa just grows wild all over the place in Timor. And this is what it looks like. And it's, it is very nutritious and it's quite delicious. And you can add it to all sorts of different dishes, including a soup that's made. Do I have an image of this? Yes. So these uh, black salt rocks, or sea rocks, they're very, they have a lot of different mineral salts in them. And when you boil them, they release both the nutritious salts and delicious flavor. And that mixed with moringa forms a very nutritious soup that many people can, can have access to and can, um, well, can gain quite a lot of nutritional benefit from. So even these, <clears throat> what we might think of as simple foods um, that are foraged, that aren't cultivated, but that are present everywhere, Again, very integrated, very woven into the fabric of Timor's food culture. These uh, may look a little bit like what some of us know as prawn crackers or shrimp chips. Uh, in this case, they are not made with shrimp, but made with uh, algae and starch. And once they're fried up, they puff up into kropak uh, or uh, prawn crackers, but they're also made locally and consumed. And another similarity, but difference from those that we know in other countries. These wild bitter beans, fascinating, um, partly because they are uh, they're not exactly toxic, but they do contain um, certain compounds that can make them very bitter unless they are properly soaked and boiled. And so like many foods, the processing, the transformation is integral to their, their, the pleasure that one takes from eating them. But what's interesting is because Timor is such an incredibly diverse place, and it's also it's not a it's not as easy to get around, let's say, as driving up and down uh, the highways of North America. And so, because of that distance and separation, local villages retain very different and distinct cultures. And so, one of those sort of wonderful things about these beans is that there are many different beliefs about the exact right way to cook them. It's a lot like the way you cook or eat pasta in Italy. Uh, depending on the village you're in, depending on the neighborhood or the part of the country, very different opinions about how these things should be cooked and eaten. Tamarind seed powder, also uh, a remarkable food product. It's very high in fiber. It binds the water in the body, so it's very good for digestion. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And it's quite delicious, but it's also generally considered by most people a waste product because the tamarind pulp is what most people are looking for in their cooking. But tamarind seeds, once they're dried and, and uh, pan fried and basically dried out by, by, by uh, dry sauteing, uh, they can be ground into, this, into the seed powder and often eaten with honey as a kind of snack or as a kind of digestive aid or just as a piece of food that you might consume. But this again, being considered in many places as a kind of superfood, even though it's just, just what we're eating here. And then this last image of a kind of amazing food, which is also not just a food, um, these are candle nuts. And candle nuts uh, in their shell in the upper left-hand corner, when cracked open, uh, have a nut inside that are a little bit like a macadamia nut or a brazil nut. Um, they're called candle nuts because they're extremely high in oil. And if you grind candle nut up, raw candle nuts, ground up and mixed effectively with cotton batting, you can form it into little torches like these ones that are shown in the image on the right. And they'll burn just like you would burn a candle or a, a little mini tiki torch in your backyard. <coughs> um, the trick about candle nuts is you really don't want to eat them raw. They also contain certain compounds that will give you a, a bit of digestive distress, but once they're roasted, uh, they're much more pleasant to eat. So raw candle nuts for burning, roast candle nuts for eating. Remember that if you ever have access to them. Throughout this project, we kept turning back to the homestay operators because we really wanted to make sure that they got something out of it. And one of the things they were looking to do was increase their culinary expertise so that when they were cooking for international travelers, they could actually represent the food of Timor and also make foods in relatively simple kitchens that would be uh, delightful and 
fun and also filling for an international traveler. And one of the foods that the, the project team came up with was a kind of flatbread made, as you can see, with this extraordinary purple colored uh, sweet potato that is one of the very common food products that's grown in Timor. And the nice thing about it is that it's highly nutritious. It can replace some of the white flour that would ordinarily go into a flatbread. This is basic, this is sort of like pita um, or naan, but it's fried on a skillet, not in a tandoor. And it uh, puffs up and it makes this incredible, delicious, chewy, bright pink bread that is both uh, delicious and a lot of fun to eat. And so there's a lot of pleasure in learning how to make this kind of food uh, and learning that it was very simple, that the sweet potatoes are available most of the year. And when they're not, you can support supplement that you can replace it with um, a squash or another food product that's available. And it would produce something that was truly very Timorese. It wasn't highly processed white bread coming from the United States or China or any other transnational food factory, but it was made here. It was made in Timor with Timorese food <clears throat> by Timorese people. <coughs> And one of the fun things that happened is because this, this fun pink bread was so inspiring to some of the homestay cooks, they also started experimenting with other things. And one of them said, well, we could make it, we could mix it with omelet. We could mix the omelet with bilimbi or with, with other kinds of pickles, or we could mix it with, uh, I think, I think I remember Alba, if you're on the phone, if you're on the line, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, with a pineapple chutney. And so they started playing around with flavor combinations because already they were triggered into this idea that food should be fun, that food should be pleasure. And this food was pleasurable. And here is a scene of little sandwiches made of the, the sweet potato flatbread and effectively omelet with chutney being served to school children who, as you can see on their faces, are looking pretty excited. And the reports were, it was not only incredibly fun food, but very satisfying and nutritious. And again, instilling in, in the kids that local food is good. Local food is interesting, fun, and worth eating. And so starting to turn the tide um, in some ways against some of those more transnational food products that had previously captured so many hearts and stomachs. So the last of the food products that I want to tell you about, are the foods, is something that the team ended up calling Me Timor. And if you'll recall uh, from the beginning of this talk, I, sh I showed you these images, this image of the cup noodles in the Saibesi market, which are called super me, like instant ramen. And the idea here was, well, how do we take a food product that is so popular and loved, that is so embedded now in particularly youth culture in Timor. How can we, we can't just tell them, no, you can't eat it. That's, nobody's gonna convince a kid or a teenager that they're not allowed to eat something that they really want to. And nobody should convince anybody that what their taste is telling them is good is, is bad or bad for you. But what you could do maybe is produce another kind of noodle that was maybe a little more nutritious, that was maybe a little bit better for a body and for the planet and the environment. And that was maybe also from the place rather than imported from another country. And this is where this idea of Mi Timor or Timor noodles came to be. And so with the help of the baker at, or the, the baker slash flower manipulator at the Agora Food Studio, the team started making different kinds of noodles. And they made them with moringa, that superfood, green superfood that I told you about before. And they made them with pumpkin or kind of pumpkin squash that is locally available. And again, that purple sweet potato. And these noodles, you can see on the slide, maybe you can see on the slide, doesn't matter if you can see the numbers or not, but they're very nutritious because it's not just white flour, it's also moringa or pumpkin or purple sweet potato that goes into these noodles. They have a great texture, one, but they have this incredibly high volume of fiber, of vitamins, of good proteins, good fat, no palm oil in them. And the noodles became very, very popular, successful, and the Agora Food Studio started even packaging them as dried noodles for people to take home and cook. One of the exciting parts of the Me Timor project is that the team behind it 
who competed in a national youth forum competition for entrepreneurship um, actually won. And they, their team uh, was awarded a trip to Kuala Lumpur to compete in the regional championships. <clears throat> they were given seed funding to develop Meet Timor. Um, of course, like everything that happened at the beginning of 2020, uh, the trip didn't take place because of COVID. But the popularity and the visibility of Timor Me, uh, Me Timor, uh, was, did gather momentum and it did actually continue to be well known. And even um, to the extent that in, during the COVID pandemic in you know, last year, the, the United Nations Development Program placed an order for 10,000 packets of Timor Me, which then got distributed as part of the food aid uh, in Timor. And so not only was uh, is it a delicious food product with a great story, but it also was an economic success because that <clears throat> money, that 20,000 US, might have gone into uh, a foreign company, might have gone into a transnational pocket rather than into the local economy. So part of the success story is showing that food can be delicious, that it can take some of the past, things like moringa and pumpkin and, and purple sweet potato, and mix it with some of the present, something like cup noodles, to create pride, deliciousness, fun, and even some economic benefit. This is a really, I think this is one of the key beautiful stories about Timor. And it also echoes what I said at the beginning, which is Timor is a place of many cultures. It has a historic indigeneity, which, is, which itself is mixed because people were migrating through and staying in Timor, but also they're moving on. There are multiple cultural influences that create a kind of mixed indigeneity. And this is one of the things that I think is very important for those of us in, in other colonized countries to understand that <clears throat> indigeneity doesn't have to be black and white. We can see things through two different sets of eyes. We can share and come together and certainly in the place we call Canada, reconciliation is about coming together on both sides and doing work to make the past and the present work together for a much more positive future. And I think Timor showed me that and showed me that there's a way to share these stories in ways in other places that might also provide some value. So coming back to this idea of eco gastronomy this lively, complex, and intersubjective way to be a useful participant in the food systems that are around us. That's something that I take with me from all of these stories and food ways of Timor. <clears throat> and I hope it's something maybe that we can all take forward as the world gets only more complex and more, more challenging to figure out, particularly when it comes to our food. Eco-gastronomy, though, as I've learned now from my experience in Timor, is not just this sort of academic framework or this way to be in the world. Eco-gastronomy is about people. It's about our stories. It's about weaving ourselves together with each other. It's about taking pride in what we know and what we do and who we are with. And although we know food is fun, when we get into sort of serious sounding words like eco-gastronomy, it's important to remember but it's also just about pleasure and taste and fun. And that is what drives so many humans to eat and do the things that they do with food. And so we need to keep it in mind. We need to never let go of the pleasure and the fun that comes from food. So just to that end, I wanna tell you a few postscript stories. Safira Gutierrez, who I believe is on the call, I saw her name pop up a little while ago. She was our storytelling coordinator, uh, facilitator for the project. Um, she was very enthusiastic about what we were doing, and she also had her own path that she needed to follow. And she went off to Australia and enrolled in a four-year program in food and nutrition studies, where I think she still is. And maybe, Sophia, you can pop a note in the chat if you are here, and that's where you are. Uh, but she was, she was helped along, and she was given a lot, of, a lot of pride and empowerment from having participated in this project. And it gave her the, the impetus, the momentum, to go off and study some more. And Josh Fernandez, who was our, our uh, managing organizer, our, our administrative manager, um, who also conducted a lot of the interviews and also gained, I believe, a sense of pride and confidence in the way that he was understanding how to ask people about food. He, with the help of Felipe da Costa, who was our, our government liaison and policy advisor, um, 
Felipe con, um, consulted with him on, on applying for a grant. And Josh also got a large uh, financial grant to go off and do similar kind of work to the TL Fix project in other parts of Timor, exploring different food products in a collaborative way with other people in the country. Back at Agora, Paula Torres has uh, became the, the local manager and took on an increased role, particularly as Mark and Alva transitioned uh, Agora into an a employee-owned organization rather than being the bosses themselves. Then they now consult back to Agora, which continues to operate um, throughout, throughout uh, COVID. And Miriam Suarez, who was one of the participants in a number of different workshops, said, I just, I, I, I don't have the quote exactly in front of me, but she just said, I am so excited to now be eating the foods that I remember eating as a kid. I remember eating them before. I remember other people eating them and I'm just I'm bringing these things back into my food ways and I'm just proud of that and it makes me happy and I want to be a food innovator. And so that to me is one of the great success stories. In parentheses, Mark and Alva and Luke, Crystal and me, we also, I think, have been transformed by this experience. I think you can't go to Timor and be unaffected. And certainly all of us, um, I feel an intense sense of connection with these people. Um, I think of them almost daily in different ways. And they continue to inspire me and, and, and make me want to share stories like this. So there's an eco-gastronomy perspective on people. Just recently, just in fact about, what, 10 days ago, there were a bunch of Instagram live conversations organized. And so a lot of the participants and a lot of those people, and there's Josh on the right hand side, came together and through the magic of technology, got to share their stories, got to share their stories about food and teamwork, their personal desires and beliefs. And that to me is also one of the great outcomes that more stories are being told, whether we think of them as contestoria or weaving an impressive and powerful future, these stories are now being shared more and more broadly. And I am, I'm so excited to know what all of these folks will be doing as they continue to be food innovators in the future. And this image, this is when I was there in 2018. This is just sums it all up for me. It's, it was about weaving together relationships. It was about pride and joy and fun and being together and making food for ourselves, for others. Uh, about making a future of food that we could be proud of, making a future of food that other people could benefit from. And uh, I do hope that those coconuts that I consumed so many years ago uh, have their magic effect and I get to be back there again before too long. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I would love to answer any questions that you have. I do see there are some things that have popped up in the chat. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that it's a human being again on the other end of his computer. Uh, and thank you very much. Well, thank you, David. That was uh, wonderful and inspiring and a wonderful story to hear. I, um, I'm sure I uh, speak for our audience too. Um, I, there are uh, a couple of questions. So first of all, Safira mentioned, she says, hi, everyone. And thanks, David, for bringing this up and that she misses Timorese food. <laughs> Uh, so I've got two questions here. So um, uh, our first question is, uh, and I think maybe you mentioned it, but before colonization, which grain or grains um, did the Timorese traditionally consume? So there was, uh, as, as, I, as I believe, and there may be someone on the call who can correct me, but sorghum and millet were two of the traditional foods um, that were sort of in, in that category of base carbohydrates. Um, there, uh, maybe someone can correct me. I believe there was a, like a starchy root, uh, a bit like uh, kumbili, but something a bit more like, um, not taro, but uh, manioc. Uh, so anyway, there would have been some of those. There we go, Job's tears, taro and cassava. Thank you, Alva. <laughs> you told me this once before, but I didn't have my notes in front of me. <laughs> so yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Alva, for <laughs> chiming in. And um, another question here. So uh, how common are grocery stores or supermarkets in East Timor and or Timor-Leste? And would most people shop at markets rather than grocery stores, given that 
about 70% of the population lives in rural areas. Yeah, so the, the, there are grocery stores in, in, I mean, I was in Dili, which is the, the capital city, which is quite large, and the grocery stores are certainly present, <clears throat> a variety of different uh, sort of flavors of grocery stores, some that are a bit more Portuguese, others that are less. The Tabasi Market is obviously a very important place for food. <coughs> Excuse me. There was also a beachfront market that was not supermarket, but that there, there, were, there were foods being sold there. Um, and then there are local markets uh, around that I have never visited, but that are, are part of the more rural landscape. But it is, it's, you know, it's always interesting when you go to a place and you think, wow, this looks a bit like, you know, X or Y. And then you realize, oh, I'm only seeing a very small slice of this country. And I understand uh, only what I understand. Oh, great. Alva is also um, informing us better about the details. You know, this is, this is the, the, the nervous thing of a, someone who gets up in front of a camera and starts talking about food when their audience members are more knowledgeable about specifics <laughs> than I am. Well, we're, we're so appreciative for what you shared. <laughs> um, I'm just going to find our next question here. Um, so, another question here Do you think? The traditional food way, I'm sorry. Do you think the traditional food ways and given the innovative practices you mentioned that the Timorese cuisine will continue, that Timorese cuisine will continue to thrive? I have to believe so. Um, I think, you know, this was a, this was a small, <clears throat> this was, well, it was a big project that was also quite small. Um, like any place, uh, the, the transnational influences around us are so powerful. <clears throat> There's so much money to be made by turning a place into a set of consumers. And there's a lot of money and a lot of effort, and a lot of marketing that's going on by the big, big transnational companies like from North America, Europe, Asia. So there will always be that pressure to consume things like cup noodles and processed foods. At the same time, and maybe even partly because of COVID. What, what the, what the Timor-Leste Food Innovators Exchange Project did was seed a kind of passion and excitement, I believe, for coming back to ourselves as Timorese people. I'm saying our, not obviously I'm not Timorese. But what it also did was it leveraged highly visible moments where, for example, 200 university students come and listen to a lecture on the importance of eating local food and the interest in eating local food. Um, for example, when Mark and Alva invited a very well-known chef from New Zealand to come and collaborate on a flavors of Timor menu that was then turned into a dinner at which the prime minister and several senior members of the government, many senior members of the government were present, and they were exposed to this extraordinarily delicious local, locally made, locally grown food that may not have looked like, you know, the stuff that they were used to at fancy banquets, but certainly measured up in terms of taste, presentation, quality, and everything else. And so in that way, you know, the way, the way to a government stomach, or the way to a government's policy is through its stomach, um, I think will have a long lasting effect. And because members and, and associates of this project are very well placed within government, within cultural organizations, within the nation building efforts that, and they were all touched by this. And, and, and you know, the Timor Leste project, or the, sorry, the TL Fitz project was, was not the only food project that's been going on. There's permaculture that's going on. There's taste education. There's a, one of our, one of the friends and, and participants, Ego Lemos, is this incredible guy who's a huge celebrity, a musician and a celebrity in Timor, but he also sings about Timorese food and many of his most popular songs are about the delicious food that Timor produces and that we eat to make ourselves happy. And so the sort of the multi, the, the, the multiple octopuses and multiple octopuses that, that the TL Fitz project represents means that what happened within this nine month project, uh, despite the fact that it didn't turn into a longer 10 year project, um, is having impacts and will continue to have impacts. And every 
couple of months, probably Mark and Alva send me notes saying, oh, this just happened and this just happened. And, you know, for example, the Instagram live conversations with just 10 days ago, you know, that just happened. And there's this, just this energy that's continuing to build. And part of it is driven by Mark and Alva's energy, but most of it, I think, is driven by the local young people who were so connected to Agora. And there were a lot of them, a lot of them who worked there, who cooked there, who talked and taught there, um, who did outreach. And that community is I mean, still thriving and it's still talking and eating. And I think that's not going anywhere. Oh, great. Um, excellent. Yeah, thank you. And um, uh, I think we'll take one last question here. And it's just um, to what degree does meat play a role in Timorese uh, cuisine, aside from fish and or, you know, sea? Seafood. Yeah, it, I mean, it's it's present, uh, pork and chicken being very common Southeast Asian foods um, that certainly come in through uh, many of the, the sort of very inexpensive and easily accessible restaurants that are very present in, in Delhi. Um, so I, I ate some surprisingly good fried chicken. Um, so, you know, there, there is meat that's certainly not uh, widely accessible and because the, the average income in Timor is not huge, there's not a ton of high quality meat that's being made. So a lot of it is the kind of meat that, um, that is somewhat problematic in terms of the ways that it's produced and somewhat problematic in terms of the, the bodies that are consuming it. But there is meat and, um, and it tends to be uh, the same kinds of meat, fish, fish definitely, but also uh, pork, chicken that you might see from other Asian countries. Well, that's great. So that's all the questions we've got here. Okay. Um, thank you, David, so much. Uh, I feel like I traveled across the globe and, and back and, and so inspiring. Um, and thank you to everyone who attended. Uh, it looks like we do have people from Timor-Leste and um, uh, on this Zoom call. So very, very exciting. And, uh, and yeah, I hope everyone has a lovely evening and Hope to see uh, those who are in Montreal or in Westmount. We hope to see you uh, uh, in the uh, coming months. So with that, good night. Thank you again, David. Thank you. And we'll see everyone soon. Take care, be well.